Well, you guys, it is an honor to be here, and I think that what's brought David and I together is what we'll talk about this afternoon is a war. You know, Miles was talking about these chemicals that go on in our bodies that either bond us or confuse us or unite us. And one of the things that we were talking about even backstage after Miles' message was the fact that um, there is a, an interesting bonding that takes place with soldiers, that same uh, chemical that Miles was talking about when you're bonding with your wife and becoming one. There's an interesting addition to that excellent message he gave that when men go into battle together and fight together, that same chemical is released in the mind of warriors. Isn't that interesting? You and I, as a spectator, would never entertain the fact that if something should happen, would we run into battle as one man? Remember in the book of Nehemiah, the scripture says that God brought the people together as though they were one man. And what's awesome about what's going on in our world around us is that Pastor David and I have been united because we're at war, men. There is a spiritual battle that is manifesting itself every single moment of the day in the physical world in which you and I live in. And I want to talk about what I believe as Christians that inside of you is not only the Holy Spirit, but I believe that God would speak to us today about the Holy Spirit causing you, calling you to engage in the war. Now listen, don't don't get upset with me when I tell you this right now. I have a burden in my heart, and it's been there for about 10 years now. I meet with a national council in Washington, D.C., the, the center of satanic power, and we would all agree from out of that location, uh, there's, there's lunatic things that go on. We would all agree. And as Christians, our politic, right, is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. But the truth is, I live here now. How many of you have kids? Raise your hands. Wow. How many of you have grandkids? Raise your hands. Listen, you and I are getting older and we're going to be checking out soon and we're going to be seeing God and that's okay with us. The bummer is, just when I was willing to to rest in that, my daughters went and had babies. And when you hold your grandchild in your arms, it changes, quite frankly, it messes up everything. Because I was about ready to retire into the arms of Jesus, and now I'm fighting a fight, and you're fighting a fight that is for our grandkids. Because listen, you and I believe Jesus could come back at any moment. I live for that. But because that's true... Because that's true, because I believe Jesus could come back at any moment, I'm fighting today. Does that make sense? You say, well, why don't you just go sit on top of the roof and wait for Christ to return? Well, what if he doesn't return for a week? There's still lunatics in power making decisions that will affect our kids. So how does this time in which you and I live in, and I love this theme, I love the challenge, and do this. I don't need to read it to you, but I'm going to. In Romans chapter 13, 11 to 14, you've already heard about it. But I want to stress this. Listen, three words, and do this. And do this. Men, are we doing it? Are we really doing it? That's the challenge. When I meet with this national council, what is the motive? Listen to this. A few days ago, we had several senators and congressmen come into our meeting of 500 pastors from across the nation. What could a senator or a congressman tell pastors? Nothing unless they were born again senators and congressmen who came into our meeting and said, men, will you please fight? This is a very convicting moment for a politician to look to pastors and say, will you fight against abortion and will you fight for marriage and will you fight for your culture? Will you fight? It's a sad day in America when Politicians challenge pastors to get into the fight. And I was convicted. And so I want to bring some things to your attention. I would ask you, because didn't Miles use the title of his message, X-Men? Doesn't that come out of a movie theme or a movie? Well, then mine's called Fight Club. (laughs) 
I want you to write that down. Fight Club. Number one regarding our fight, gentlemen, and I believe that you are sitting in a church, and I know many of you attend churches where Christianity is not a spectator faith. There's no such thing as spectatorship Christianity. So, Jesus commented on that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. In fact, it's staring at me over here to the left on the wall. Awesome to see. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's impossible, by the way. It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and to be trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it might give light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men. That's a commandment, gentlemen. By the way, before I finish this verse, get ready to raise your hand. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. How many of you men in this room, don't lie, you're in church. How many of you men in this room right now are Christians? Raise your hands. Put your hands down. From this moment forward, you have heard one message today after another. Quite frankly, I was sitting right back there for the last uh, two messages, and this is my conclusion. You don't need to hear another sermon. I was thinking back there, I'm so responsible for what I heard John say. I'm so responsible for what I heard Miles say. I'm so responsible for what I heard David say or Pastor Chuck. We are so responsible for what we've heard. There's no escaping. We just testified a moment ago that we're Christians and that we are men. Listen, in our culture, Satan hates your guts. That's why Hollywood cranks out commercials, for example. Have you noticed? Watch commercials these days. You and I, as men, collectively, we are such idiots, we don't even know how to buy a car. Have you noticed that in commercials? We have to ask our wife what car we should buy. Have you noticed that? We don't know how to fix a computer. We've got to ask our 13-year-old on these commercials. Have you noticed that? All these portrayals of husbands and men are a bunch of dopes who don't know anything. You know what? That tells me something. That our culture is scared to death of men becoming and acting like Christians. They're terrified that a man would stand up and rise up and be somebody in our culture that would be worth following. Chief Pruitt, Miles Pruitt, I know him personally. He's the real deal. He didn't come out here a moment ago and talk to you about something that he doesn't practice. It's the real deal. I love that. And God is challenging you and I to be the salt and the light to our culture. Now, that verse that we read a moment ago, that sounds sweet. That's something that our little kids learn in Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And we pat our kids on the head and say, that's cute, that's cute. Wait a minute, do you understand that all of us who raised our hands a moment ago, if we do this, our homes will change, our children will change, our wives will change, our street will change, our city will change, our culture will change. Don't get me wrong. These things will change. But Christian, we are to do these things, do it, and do this with the constant awareness of Christ coming back at any moment. Think about it. I don't know about you, listen. Is this world nuts? You think it's nuts. Do you know, I know people, you know people who thinks, they think it's awesome. <laughs> do you know some of those people? They think it's fantastic. This is wrong. You and, I, you and I see something, we go, oh man, that's wrong. This is crazy. Teaching little kids, five-year-old L.A. County School District how to put condoms on? That's sick. You know what? There's people walking around very happy about this. You understand that? We're at war, guys. And the more we are quiet, the more that we are silent, the more that we do not shine the light, guess what? Darkness is advancing. It's everywhere. But you know what? You know what's so cool about the side that you're on? When you stand up and when you begin to lovingly, truthfully, but can I say this word? Can I say it? I know I'm going to be misunderstood, but hear me out. The original word for tolerance is not surrender. The original word for tolerance is to hold your ground, respect what others have their views on, even if they're wrong, you can respect them, 
But you don't surrender, gentlemen. You don't surrender. Oh, you Christians are so intolerant. Listen, we are the most tolerant people. Christians are the most tolerant people. I had somebody tell me in a a debate regarding homosexuality that I was intolerant because I disagreed with them. And I said, listen, someday you're going to need me because I am not what you think I am. If you, as a homosexual, fall down and cut yourself, I'm going to pick you up and give you a bandage and get you to the hospital. As a Christian, though you and I disagree, I love you. Listen, if Islam has its way, there will be no homosexuality in America because if you know anything about Islamic countries, they kill homosexuals or whatever the situation might be. If we don't shine our light, the love of God, the grace of God, and the truth, as John was saying, the gospel, if we give people the gospel, the unadulterated gospel, the pure gospel, guys, we need to know how to give it, by the way, in shining that light, giving the gospel. Listen, don't do this if you talk to somebody and you're, you think you're witnessing. You know what that looks like when you think you're witnessing? Hey, hi, how are you? I, I see you have a cross around your neck. Uh, yeah, I have a cross. Uh, do you believe in God? Uh, yeah, I do. Oh, that's awesome. And then you tell people you met a Christian. You have no idea what you just met. You don't, don't know what that person... God who? Right? Well, they're wearing a cross. The cross is the biggest selling piece of jewelry on the planet. Did you know that? What God? Who do you believe in? You believe in God. What God? Ask them. And what do they think about the Lord Jesus Christ? A lot of people believe in God. Listen, be able to share the gospel everywhere you go. It doesn't mean you have to be a big mouth. You have to be loud about it or rude about it. Here's what you do need to do. Lord Jesus, I'm going to work today. Or I'm going out onto the field today. Or I'm going to the site today. I'm asking you, Lord, to provide for me the opportunity. And when it happens, let me know it. Guys, I almost said ladies and gentlemen. That wouldn't have gone over well today. Men. (laughs) Men. Men, trust God enough, will you? I want to leave this mandate before we press into the next thing. You, it is incumbent upon you and I to say, Lord, where am I to not shine the light? You guys know the answer to that, right? Where am I not to shine the light of the gospel? Exactly. Everywhere. There is no place off, watch, no place off limits when it comes to the gospel and living for Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not talking about grabbing your desk, jumping on top in your cubicle and preaching. Don't do that. I'm talking about living a life of reality for Jesus. Guys, listen, a lot was mentioned earlier, and I want to make sure I say it now because I'm over 55 and I'll forget in a few minutes. Um, Guys, a lot was said about pornography, let me, let me tell you something really quick. Um, I was never a drug, a drug addict before I accepted Christ. Um, I wasn't in a gang. Uh, I, I, I didn't drink as a non-Christian. Um, two things I loved to do. I didn't believe in God. I didn't know who God was. But uh, it was very obvious to me that women were amazingly, wonderfully designed. And that was my problem. From a very early age, pornography and then living it out until the day I met Jesus. And the other thing was violence, fighting. Love to fight and I love to have sex. And that's how I was until Jesus got a hold of me at the age of 19. I'm sure I would never have survived my lifestyle. But I want to tell you something right now, guys, that I pray and I'm going to bite my lips so I don't cry about it because I'm in front of a bunch of men. I would do anything today to convince you that the greatest robbery that's taking place today is in the privacy of not only your own home, but on your own personal device. The greatest robbery is Satan, like you may be saved and you may be going going to heaven, but Satan now wants you bound and, and wrapped up in your ancient grave cloths like Lazarus. Remember, Jesus said, somebody let him go. Isn't that wild? Jesus calls Lazarus forth from the dead and then says, somebody unwind him. And many of you guys, you have eternal life in you, but you're bound. And I want to tell you something right now. I lived that life that you may be dabbling in. And Jesus came and saved me. And let me tell you something right now. 
if I were to click again, I'd still be going to heaven. But gentlemen, by God's grace, I have not, and I will not do it. And here's the reason why. Are you listening? That you would fall in love more with what God wants to do in your life than a five-minute click. Satan will always knock on the door of your heart and mind and say, just click right here. Your wife's not giving it to you enough or, or whatever that's not happening. Just click right here. Guys, what you want to be able to do is be presenting yourself before the Lord, being used by God, that when that moment comes, you say, no way. Five-minute click? Like Samson to get my hair cut and lose all power? No way. No way. Oh, come on, Pastor. I mean, I'd still be saved. You know what? You'd be saved, but you'd be neutered in the power. God rescinds his power. I want God to use you men. Think of our community. Think of our state, our county. If we presented ourselves today, as many of you did earlier with Miles, and you said, that's it, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to do this for the Lord. And fall in love with one minute of his hand upon your back. You know, I'm going to tell you something about Pastor David. He and I, we've never talked about this. We don't have to. It's shared among those who labor in the word. And I'll be doing it tomorrow. He'll be doing it tomorrow. And it's this. I pray, I lust for what I'm about to tell you. I lust for it. You come out to the podium. Doesn't matter what service it is. It happens every service. And you start and you're praying. And you may be reading the verse. You may be teaching the word. But you're, you're saying, Lord, show up. Please, God, in your power be present. Lord, let me know that you're here. And the moment that happens, guys, I don't know. How, listen, it sounds kind of, but I'm telling you right now, I can, I can sense a, a hand upon the middle of my back and it's God saying, go. At our pulpit, beneath my feet, engraved in bronze, it says, if you have prayed yourself ready, then let yourself go. And then that moment, God wants to do that in your life. Guys, he wants to do it in your life. Don't think for a moment, well, you know what, that's, that's great for you, but I'll never have that. Don't do that. That's a lie from hell. Let your light so shine. God wants to use you, gentlemen. All that you need to do today is what began earlier when you presented yourself regarding purity. By the end of this message today, I'm going to do something to you that Mike McIntosh did to me 30, probably 30 years ago. I was just one in a crowd, but he gave a challenge. And so Jesus is saying, if we're going to be in this fight club of faith, Believing that he could come at any second, but until he does come, we're going to make our lives matter for the kingdom of God. The next thing is this. There's no greater challenge. There's no greater effect, letting your light shine, and there's no greater challenge. Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, you know it. Joshua says, listen, if you want to serve the God of your fathers and those pagan gods, then go do it. If you want to serve the Baals and the Astros of your father's pagan religions, then go do it. But what did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Gentlemen, as for you and your house, you will decide to serve the Lord. Nobody can do this for you. Miles can't do it for you. Pastor David can't do it for you. I can't do it for you. You've got to decide. Every day you're going to have to decide. And there's no greater challenge than To get up tomorrow morning, I hesitated because I'm thinking, well, this day is halfway through. It's, uh, it's not too late to even say it now. Dear God, fill me with your Holy Spirit before my feet hit my floor in my room. Give me the power to live for you. And by the end of this message, we're going to ask for the power of God. Choose today whom you'll serve. Gosh, I loved what Miles was teaching about. Isn't it so true? I've been married 34 years. I've been with one woman for 34 years. But isn't it amazing, gentlemen, that those of us who, we, before we came to Christ, so to that physical world, isn't it amazing that if you relax your mind right now for one second, you see the past, though it's 35 plus, 37 plus years ago in my Christian experience, in my life, isn't it bizarre that 
what Miles was talking about, memory embossed or, or kept in a bank, as it were. You can see things in technicolor in an instant. Isn't it amazing? How come you can't remember verses like that from 37 years ago? How come, how come you can't remember when your dad said, great job, son? No, we remember all the minutia of this world. Why? Because you are a spiritually created being. God made you in his own image, not angels. Think of that. You. And you battle with your conscience because there's an ancient effervescent, as it were. There's a distant ember still burning. Maybe you're here today and you're not even a Christian. But you know there's something about conscience. Where does this come from? If you are an evolutionary byproduct, then you should not have a conscience. And by the way, if evolution is true, then we can get to do whatever we want to do and, and it all works out and it's the survival of the fittest and, and what's best works out in the end. Well, then why is the world falling apart at the seams? People are more broken now than ever before. And why is it that no matter what somebody says, including Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, I mean, think about him. I mean, that guy died recently and went straight to hell. He denied the existence of God. His... His theology is better than yours and I right now. I mean, he knows exactly the truth now. <laughs> it's just a little too late. All of these people who say, no, God doesn't exist. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, nope, God can't exist. No, listen, he does exist. You don't want him to exist because he has been speaking to you all your life. And he's so awesome because he really loves you. He's, listen, this is how much he loves you. When you were making out with bubbles in the back of the car and it went a certain way and you thought nobody knew, God was there, God knows, nobody knows. You say, no, 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 you know, she moved on and nobody knows, God knows, and you know God knows. And he loves you, listen, he loves you so much that he cannot go, well, it's okay, Billy Bob, uh, you just, it's all right, I'll just turn the other way, forget that ever happened. He is holy. And listen, outside of Jesus Christ, you are unholy. And the Bible says your sin has separated you from God. And if you and I were God, we would say, oh, let him burn. As long as I'm going to heaven, who cares? God's not like us. God is hounding you. And he won't let you rest. He won't let you sleep. I love that face. Miles McPherson gave about your wife asking you, you know, where you've been or how you doing. I'm fine or whatever, but that busted look. You know what? Maybe it's not on that face of yours, but it's on your heart. God sees it every day. And he convicts you of sin. That's how much he loves you. He will not tolerate your going to hell. He won't tolerate it. He loves you so much. He loves you more than you love you. And he... He wants you to choose today. So I want you to think about that. The third and final thing I want to leave with you is this. Jesus said in John 15, verse 18, he said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus said this. Guys, Jesus said this. Gentlemen, who was the most loving person that the world has ever recorded for us to know? Who is he? Who raised the dead? Who forgave people who were caught in the very act of sins? Jesus. And Jesus says, they're going to hate you because they hated me first. Have you ever thought about that? I've been thinking a lot about this. The Huffington Post had an article about how hateful I am because I stood up for the defense of marriage and I said that the reason why I'm standing for the defense of marriage is for no political reason. It's because God said in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 7, and 8, that he invented marriage, and it's between a male and a female. Thus, I'm a hater. I'm homophobic, they said. And it broke my heart, because when I read that article, I thought, you know what? I mean, this is not good. Because what I really, really, if I'm going to be biblical, if I'm going to be biblical, I'm going to be hated. If you're going to be biblical, you're going to be hated. But what are we hated for? We need to be hated for being like Jesus, gentlemen. Listen, if we're not hated by the forces of hell and darkness, right now, something's wrong. Look, Huffington Post may hate me. That's not good enough for me. I want hell to hate me. Listen, you want hell to hate you.